Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, can I war welcome you most warmly here? Um, it really is such a pleasure and privilege that so many have come out to what I'm sure will be a very special uh, evening to hear such interesting things said. My name is Ian White. Um, I'm the current Vice Chancellor of the University of Bath. And tonight, of course, is the second event in this series of the future of our lands, uh, a series which seeks to address the fundamental issues of how we use and manage our land, uh, the future of UK farming, and how we can increase and protect the range of biodiversity in our ecosystems whilst providing nutritious and sustainable food for our nation. And it's really pleasing to see so many individuals here in their own capacity, but also uh, such a wide range of organizations and businesses represented here. Um, and I, as a result, can I thank you so much for the contributions that you will be making in the course of the evening through informal discussions and uh, otherwise. Can I also say how honored we are to be joined by the Lord Lieutenant uh, of Somerset, Mrs. Annie Moore, who's championing of agriculture and farming within our region and boundless support for this event it really is greatly appreciated. Thank you so much. Uh, as I said at the first lecture, the University of Bath respects scientific evidence and recognizes the need uh, for urgent action to tackle climate change. And we've acknowledged the part that we can play in addressing this significant challenge, working alongside governments, businesses, as well as, of course, food producers and farmers. Um, the university is engaged in a very major series of activities in climate and sustainability, um, as well as seeking to support the education of the next generation of leaders, and also seeing, as we're doing tonight, how we can think strategically about how we can uh, engage better with the planet. Um, it's recognized that the prevalent current practices of UK farming contribute to our carbon emissions, from methane production from livestock, through the use of pesticides, herbicides, and slurry production. Yet our agricultural industry has the unique opportunity to be transformed from a net carbon producer to a carbon sink through, a mother th an, a, 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 among other things, carbon sequestration, precision farming, or rewilding. And there's a, an ambition amongst some pioneering UK farmers to move towards net zero farming emissions. And to do this, indeed, by 2040, whilst remaining financially viable producers of high welfare, nutritious food. But how can this be achieved? I was interested to read the article by His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, in this week's edition of Country Life, in which he echoes many of the themes of this series. He notes that at a time of unprecedented change and uncertainty, it's perhaps worth reminding ourselves that the diversity of the British countryside, which so many of us know and love, is a wonderful synthesis of the interaction between geography, geology, biology, and climate, molded by the activity of thousands of years of human endeavor. <coughs> and of course, as a university, we are heavily engaged in multidisciplinary activity. We've activities engaged in various aspects of the global challenge, sustainable power, crop resilience, flooding, and economic impact. And I'd like just to highlight, for example, the Faculty of Engineering's research into agricultural robotics. This research acknowledges the pressures placed on the global food change by population growth, climate change, political pressures affecting migration, population drift from rural to urban regions, and the demographic of an aging population. And these are major challenges. I was struck very much last week to be in a city called Shenzhen in China, a city which in the 1980s had 40,000 people, half or so the population of Bath. It's now 10 million people. Uh, half an hour in the high-speed train, you get to a city uh, called Guangzhou, which is 40 million people. And it was fascinating talking to the dean of the institute there about how they were planning within 20 years or so to have an urban region of 400 million people. The pressures that that will sustain 
on the agriculture and nature indeed around us are truly awesome. And any technologies that can alleviate that and address that must surely be welcome. And of course, we are so proud that Bath, along with Bristol, Exeter, Southampton and Surrey, uh, was awarded for the third year in the row the top global incubator for new companies, the award being made this year in Qatar, um, this organization being best based in Bath. And therefore, well able to take up some of the new ideas which not only the university, but many of those organizations represented here will be generating in the years. And so tonight, there are a series of questions that we'll be considering. How can we ensure that the way we grow, distribute, and eat food provides healthy and affordable nutrition whilst restoring ecosystems and improving the livelihoods of farmers? What does the future of British farming look like? How can we measure and value sustainability and soil plant and animal health, while at the same time protecting our farmers and farming communities, as well as the environment. <coughs> we must continue to learn and engage with one another when tackling the climate crisis and the future of farming and food production in the UK. I'm absolutely convinced it's only by universities listening and learning from others, as well as hopefully engaging in proactive ways that we can address such major problems. And therefore tonight, it is a real honor for me to be present at what I'm sure will be the most wonderful uh, debate. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you uh, very much indeed, uh, Vice Chancellor. Um, and welcome everybody. I'm Nick Pierce. I'm the director of the Institute for Policy Research here at the uh, university. I'll be chairing this evening's uh, proceedings. As the Vice-Chancellor uh, mentioned, this is the second uh, event in a series of lectures and debates we will be holding uh, entitled The Future is in Our Lands and we are interested principally tonight in these questions, uh, as the Vice-Chancellor has mentioned, of food and f uh, food supply, production, consumption, uh, farming after we come out of the European Union, particularly if we leave the European Union uh, next year, then the common agricultural policy will need to be replaced. There are major challenges uh, involved in that set of policy questions, and of course, there is the overarching challenge of, of climate change. So there's an awful lot for us uh, to discuss and debate, and we've got a great panel uh, this evening uh, to do that for us. Um, I'm going to start right, right at the end is Phil Stocker, Chief Executive of the National Sheep Association, uh, who's going to... Uh, I'm, not, I'm going to come backwards and do it in this hall, if you don't mind. Uh, we've also got Patrick Holden, who's the founding director uh, of the Sustainable Food Trust, working internationally to accelerate the transition towards more sustainable food systems. Uh, next to him, we have Jack Farmer, who is a co-founder and operations lead at Let Us Grow, which is pioneering environmentally conscious plant science uh, farming, uh, indoor farming in particular. Uh, uh, next to him is Joe Edwards, who is a farmer at uh, Castle Farms Organic, which is just nearby, a local farm very near here. Uh, and then finally, Joe Lewis, who is po uh, Policy and Strategy Director uh, at the Soil Association, leading their policy unit and the development of their strategy in support of a vision of good food for all. So it's a great panel. We're going to have about 10 minutes from each, um, and then I'll open it up to lots of questions and debate. I do need to say that we're filming and recording this evening's proceedings, just to let you know that. Uh, if you have a mobile, please put it onto silent. And if you do have to leave before the end, please do so quietly out of respect for our speakers. Thank you very much indeed. Right, I'm going to ask Joe to come up first to kick us off. Joe, thank you. Thank you, good evening. What I want to talk to you about this evening is two main things. The first is how farming uh, is at the heart of resolving not one crisis, but three, climate, nature, and health. And failure to join the dots between those crises uh, would be a huge missed opportunity, but also risks making the problem worse uh, and not better. And the second thing I want to talk to you about is on the diet side, what do we urgently need to see coming out of the national food strategy, you'll be aware, as being led by Henry Dimbleby. But first, uh, I should probably say a few words about the Soil Association, for those of you who aren't familiar with us. Uh, we are a membership charity. Our mission is to restore nature and health and a safe climate from the ground up. We're known for pioneering the development of organic food standards, 
uh, and our certification arms logo you'll see widely used on organic food. What's less well known is that we're a co-founder of the Forest Stewardship Council with the UK's leading certifier of sustainable forests. In 50 countries around the world, more than 16 million hectares of sustainable forests. And our work spans from forest and field to fork. There are two big programmes where we're trying to change our relationship with food and make healthy and sustainable diets the new normal. Some of you may have heard of Food for Life. Uh, we believe that every single child should have the opportunity to grow up cooking and growing and eating and sharing real food. Uh, and the schools and the nurseries that make this possible, we celebrate with our Food for Life awards. We also have our Food for Life Served Here scheme for healthy and sustainable menus, which is in 10,000 schools, as well as universities and hospitals. Uh, I should do a shout out at this point to my <coughs> children's school here in Bath, WASPs, uh, where Chef Stew is a champion of Food for Life, and also local entrepreneur Rich Osborne. I don't know if there's anyone here from Fresh Range tonight, but they're in their logistical solutions are making it possible for local producers to supply into school meals, which is fantastic. So, uh, oh, I should also mention Sustainable Food Cities. There may be people here from Bain's Local Food Partnership. Sustainable Food Cities is a network of more than 70 cities and places that we coordinate with Sustain and Food Matters, uh, where local authorities and businesses and academics, uh, civil society groups are coming together to make good food a defining characteristic of where they live. Uh, again, Bath is a, is, a, is a leader of the pack, holding the prestigious Bronze Sustainable Food City Award. So do get involved if you can. But back to the climate crisis. Uh, in the lead up to COP26 in Glasgow in December next year, there'll obviously be a deepening focus on the climate crisis, but it's absolutely crucial that we keep those two other crises in view. So the nature crisis, uh, and the dietary health crisis. Uh, let me start with the dietary health crisis. The 2018 Global Nutrition Report uh, was a massive indictment of the global food system. 88% of countries globally have overlapping burdens of obesity and malnutrition due to a poor quality diet. At the launch of the Global Nutrition Report, the then International Development Minister uh, and now former Conservative MP, Alistair Burt, he was one of the 21, he said, this is a food system problem. It's not providing people with affordable, nutritious food, it's providing them with cheap, processed food. And yet, that public health consensus and international development consensus is not translating through into the debates about the future of farming. So time and again, we're told we cannot afford to farm with nature because we need to double yields to feed the world. But the yields that we're told that we need to double are of all the wrong things. Maize, soy, oilseed crops, uh, chiefly going into livestock feed, ultra-processed food, biofuels, and incredibly land-hungry, often driving deforestation. Pulses, fruit, veg, nuts take up a lot less land, and public health voices could bring a really valuable correction to that debate. The Eat Lancet Commission argued what we need is not yield maximisation uh, of the wrong crops, it is nutritious crop diversity. The other way in which we're not joining the dots is between the climate crisis and the nature crisis. So the Climate Change Committee have shown fantastic leadership in getting legislative backing for net zero. Uh, at the same time, they're advocating on the farming and land use front an increase in our consumption of grain-fed white meat to compensate us for the reduction in red meat in our diets. At the same time, they are advocating further intensification of farming to free up land for tree planting and biofuels. But in the same week that the Climate Change Committee published their groundbreaking net zero report, we had the IPBES report, this is a sister panel to the IPCC, which you'll be aware of. It was a devastating UN uh, global assessment of biodiversity and land degradation. Study after study is showing global insect decline, and the scientists are concluding that it's intensive farming and pesticides uh, that are to blame. The UN also concluded that we cannot halt climate change uh, without reversing soil degradation. Soil holds three times more carbon than the atmosphere. 
Uh, but at the moment, our soils are leaking carbon globally and in the UK uh, due to intensive farming. Sir Bob Watson, who was the chair of the IPCC, was also then chair of this IPBES panel. Uh, and he said, governments have focused on climate change far more than they have focused on loss of biodiversity or land degradation. All three are equally important to human well-being. So, how could we do things differently if we did join the dots? Well, happily, uh, there's a French policy research institute called IDRI, uh, who are linked to, affiliated to Sciences Po, the Oxbridge of France, uh, and they took it on themselves to model how to optimise the outcomes from farming and land use for climate and nature and health, with the help of a team of scientists and agronomists. It's called 10 Years for Agroecology in Europe, and what they model is a whole tra cell transition uh, to agroecology, which is farming with natural systems first and chemicals last. Organic is the best established example. Essentially, by 2050, they're modelling the phase-out of artificial nitrogen fertilisers, which drive all those nitrous oxide emissions, a potent and long-lived greenhouse gas, and a phase-out of pesticides. And what they found is that uh, that system could feed a growing European population <coughs> a healthy diet and maintain export capacity. It achieves the same climate impact reduction as the Climate Change Committee's scenarios. It restores soil and it restores biodiversity. So it needs to be taken seriously. The IDRI model assumes we all eat less meat like the other models, but crucially the priority for diet shift for eating less meat is to reduce grain-fed meat in our diet, not red meat per se. And in that, it does chime with the conclusions of the latest IPCC land use report. The reason for that, so that's uh, grain-fed meat, that could be US feedlot-style beef, uh, intensively produced pork or poultry. And the reason for that is that nearly 60% of cereals, 70% uh, of oilseed crops produced in Europe are going to feed livestock. If we diverted less land to livestock feed and biofuels, we would have far more room for farming with nature, restoring soil, achieving that climate impact reduction. And of course, the outgoing Chief Medical Officer, Sally Davies, has done so much to draw attention to the way in which intensive livestock production is driving the antimicrobial resistance crisis as well. Now, if you haven't read the RSA Food Farming Commission, uh, future, the RSA Commission on the Future of Food Farming in the Countryside, it was called, it produced a report uh, which was, had the same title as this evening, The Future of our, in Our Lands. Uh, I would really recommend you read it. It cuts beautifully across those silos uh, of climate, nature and health. Our chief executive, Helen Browning, uh, was on the commission and is also in Helen, uh, Henry Dimbleby's advisory panel for the new national food strategy. Just quickly, um, two things are priorities for that national food strategy on the diet side. Uh, firstly, we have to, foc it has to focus on uh, fresh and minimally processed food from short sustainable supply chains, not just reformulation of processed food. Uh, in the UK, we have the most highly processed diet in Europe. 51% of our diet is ultra-processed food compared to 14% in France, 13% in Italy. Calorie counting is no substitute for <coughs> nutrition when it comes to a healthy diet. And secondly, we need world-leading procurement of food education to make healthy and sustainable diets the norm. And that means more and better fruit, vegetables, pulses, whole grains, less and better meat, more grass-fed meat, uh, and a lot less food waste and ultra-processed food. If anything I've said has resonated with you this evening, do consider becoming a member of the Soil Association and also getting involved with all that's happening locally uh, through Bain's Local Food Partnership. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Joe. And uh, yeah, uh, there's obviously a, a lot going on locally, uh, as well as, as you say, what you're doing on the national level and some very interesting research that you pointed to there as well. OK, so our next speaker is Phil Stocker. Phil, I've introduced. Uh, you've got your clicker. So I think it's yeah, I've yeah. brought you some nice uh, pictures tonight as well, so I hope you enjoy. Okay. Uh, but thank you very much for inviting me. Um, let's see if this is going to come. Oh. There we go. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for inviting me to, part, to be part of this uh, debate tonight. Um, there appears to be, there is no doubt, I would say, that there are, we, we are at a crucial tipping point for the future of, of this planet. Um, climate change is undoubtedly altering our weather patterns. It's raising water levels, uh, it's melting glaciers, uh, it's affecting where people can live, 
and affecting our ability to produce food. At the same time, water is being recognised to become an increasingly limiting factor. Wildfires are raging around the earth and habitat and species loss is changing our ecological balance and is morally unacceptable as well. And I've lost time, of the number of, uh, lost count, sorry, of the number of times that British sheep farming has been blamed for all these things. So it is good to be part of debates like this and to listen as well as try to explain what we're doing and to make the case that how, how we manage many of our upland and lowland areas in the UK with grazing animals is neither killing the planet nor cruel. In fact, I'd argue that sheep are the, almost the ultimate in sustainable, renewable technology and that it won't just be our past generations that have benefited from these animals being on, our, on Earth, but for generations to come, we'll still enjoy these animals underpinning our agriculture economy. Make sure I've got the right picture. Um, so sheep farming contributes to feeding us with some of the most nutritious and delicious meat that there is. And, it keeps us, uh, and in doing so, it keeps us warm and comfortable through wool in one of the most sustainable ways possible, using mainly grass and forage that is grown often with little more than soil nutrients, sunshine and rain. In doing this, it puts more into the soil than it takes out, maintaining and building soil organic matter, soil carbon and soil life. And in doing this, it's done in one of the most natural conditions that suit the physio physiological needs of these animals. The problem is that we've had science behind the, uh, the greenhouse gas inventories that is complete and not holistic and doesn't consider complete life cycles. And we've also had much of the advice over the last 50 years, a long period of time, and I would say it's getting a lot better now, but over the last 50 years, food-related advice uh, that is sus suspect and can be argued to have taken society in the wrong direction. These ble beautiful animals, these are um, blue-faced lesters on the left-hand side and border lesters on the right-hand side. And uh, you know, they are stunning. I mean, it, we, we, we're in a lovely place to see a picture like this, but these are stunning animals. As, and as a lot of you, as us, drive around the countryside and we see these little white dogs, dots in our fields, some people refer to them as woolly maggots, actually. I can't, but I can't bear that. But, you know, we see them as dots in the field, but these are absolutely stunning, admirable uh, animals. Um, and I would also say that the people who look after them are, are some of the no m most noble people that we've got in this country as well. But for some 15 years now, ruminants, cattle and sheep essentially, have been demonised for damaging the environment, largely through methane emissions. The problem was caused by all three of our main greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide and methane, being all lumped together into, a, into carbon equivalents and assumed that they were all behaving in the same way. But as we've recently found out, um, work from Oxford University is now showing that methane has a far shorter life cycle in relation to carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide. Uh, methane will last for somewhere in a region of 12 to 20 years within the atmosphere, whereas CO2 and N2O will last for hundreds of year, years and just build and build in the atmosphere. Um, their findings suggest that as long as livestock numbers are relatively stable, then methane will not be adding to greenhouse gas concentrations. And anything that we can do to reduce methane outputs will actually contribute to cooling, not warming. Nitrous oxide is another greenhouse gas that has been lumped together uh, to create carbon equivalents and is associated with red meat production, largely through soil process processes and uh, urine deposition. But work coming from, uh, from Bangor University has recently shown that nitrous oxide emissions are understudied and may be significantly lower than previously assumed, possibly between a quarter and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and 1%, there's two, two different factors there, isn't it? 1% and a quarter, but much, much lower than has been used in the, in the carbon inventories. And that the importance and consideration of, uh, of, of climate science is, is not complete at the moment. Uh, a few uh, facts just on our, our sheep industry. Our, sh our sheep industry has been um, evident in this country for somewhere in the region of 5,000 years as well. It's been with us for a long, long time. Um, we are, uh, in comparison with other sheep producing nations around the country, and I'm thinking mainly there of New Zealand and Australia, we are a, a very small country with a large and largely urbanised population. Um, we have a high public and regulatory expectation for food safety um, and traceability. Uh, our environmental regulations and requirements are some of the highest in the world. We still have further to go. Um, and high standards for animal welfare as well. We're recognised as being a real leader in this field globally. Um, we're a tiny island um, and highly urbanised, but we're still the sixth largest sheep producer in the country. 
and we're the third largest exporter of sheep meat globally as well. There's some interesting stati statistics there because we would export virtually as much sheep meat as we import, and much of that has been done for seasonality, to balance seasonality, and to balance uh, carcass as well, uh, different cuts on the carcass. Around about 35% of our production is exported, with 95, 96% actually of that uh, exported volume going to the European Union, and you can see there why that continued free access to the European market is essential for the UK. 65% um, is left of our production, goes into our domestic market, and it's a very varied domestic market as well, from uh, our supermarkets, and they would probably only account for about 40% of our production, high street butchers and farm shops, and ha the halal market is also a very important aspect uh, of our market. And uh, I'm sure that this will, or I, I wouldn't su be surprised if this comes up in debate later on, but just to inform people that the halal market would already be supplied by around about 60% of that volume being pre-slaughter stunned. So there's often a misconception uh, that uh, if it's halal, it's, uh, it's not pre-slaughter stunned, but around about 60% would be. Um, we have a high dependence on grass and, and free range, and it's estimated that uh, sheep farming in the UK is around about 90% reliant on grass and forage for, for its feed stuff. So it's not reliant on hard feed, cereals and soya, um, not to a great extent. We have a high um, uh, dependence on free range as well. And most of our sheep are free range. The only time that they're normally housed would be six weeks around, around the lambing period and sometimes for a short period when lambs are being finished. Sheep farming is also closely linked to natural landscapes and it's got a very high involvement in agro-environment agro schemes, with some of our most beautiful areas in the country, I would say, being created in part by, by sheep farming. I never think it's any great surprise that the areas of the country where most of our visitors flock to, uh, because of its, uh, its landscape and its beauty and its culture and its communities, are areas where sheep farm, farming is, is, is at the base. Um, the Lake District would be one good example, and the Welsh... Welsh Hills and much of Wales would be another one, and our West Con the West Country as well. Um, just a, a quick mention of, of wool. It might be surprise you that just 1.1% of global, global textiles are wool, with 65% coming from oil-based synthetic substances. Wool is a stable carbon store that is hard-wearing, fire-retardant, and as insulation can uh, absorb chemical contaminants as well. Despite claims to the contrary, sheep shearing is not cruel, in fact, it's done largely to improve the welfare conditions for sheep, and the majority of wool costs more to remove than it returns in value. Yet it can produce some of the mo most glorious products that provide warmth and protection, as well as a, a lot of pleasure. So our challenge uh, as farmers and as sheep farmers post-Brexit is to do two things. One is to increase our productivity, and uh, second is to, whilst doing so, improve our environment. And it's really quite fulfilling now to, to recognise that when we talk about the environment, we don't just talk about agro-environment schemes and, uh, and bird numbers. We are talking much more broadly in terms of our environment, um, our, our, our natural capital, our ability to store carbon, habitats and wildlife, but also our social environment as well, communities, people and well-being. Um, Productivity is, uh, is possibly a misleading world, word, and when this was first talked about uh, two and three years ago, I, along with most other people in the farming world, I think, assumed that this was about us producing more to feed a growing global population. But actually, recently, it's turned out that the word productivity is more about efficiency, and when we're challenged to increase our productivity, we're really being challenged to in increase our efficiency, to reduce waste and loss, and essentially for our business enterprises to become less reliant on subsidy. Um, so with those two challenges of increasing productivity and improving our environment, the future of farm support payments, which are going more towards public goods, mm -hmm. is something that we would very much welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. So some important policy questions at, at the end of Phil's remarks there in particular. We'll come back to those. Uh, our, our next speaker is another farmer I mentioned earlier, Joe Edwards from Castle Farm Organics. Joe. Hello, and welcome to my wonderful city of Bath. I'm very proud to be speaking to you at Bath University, where both my sister and father studied. I've been a member of the Soil Association for 23 years and produced fruit, veg, salad leaves, flowers, 
and Angus Beef here in Bath. My husband and I have been beef producers alongside our other businesses for many years. We started farming in 1985 in Pembrokeshire, West Wales, with a small holding and then a 120 acre farm with sheep and stalled cattle. After we returned to Bath in 1995 to be near my parents, we started our farm in Midford, converting land that had previously been Fuller's Earth site and which had been fallow for some decades. After initial infrastructure works, we purchased 15 weaned calves and built this up over a five year period into a small suckler herd. During this process, we converted the land to organic and did the same with our Pembrokeshire farm on which we established a Welsh black suckler herd run by a herdsman. My dream in Bath was to create an auberge like the ones we visited while on holiday in France, a place where you eat what is good today and what is of the area. After a long planning battle, I started the farm garden with a couple of mums who were in school with <coughs> my kids. We finished our jobs as full-time mums and wanted to use some of our skills to grow some lovely veg and to try and make the world a better place. I had allotments before, initially with my dad as a child and then as an adult, and used the skills I'd learnt there to start Castle Farm. I read every gardening book I could find and discovered I was quite a good gardener. You just have to work hard, feed the soil, not the plant, and realise nature is much bigger and stronger than you, so try and go with the flow, not fight it. <laughs> the thing I found difficult in the beginning was the selling. People are creatures of habit, they don't like new things. British people want cheap food. There is a lot of talk about wanting organic food, but people don't want to pay more for their food, and organic food does cost a bit more to produce. I managed to get a local whole food shop harvest to sell my produce, but even there I had to put the same product in the same place week after week before people realised it was top quality and worth a few pennies more than supermarket prices that I was charging. Because the work was so demanding and heavy, I soon realised that we couldn't manage all the heavy lifting and digging etc alone, and with limited funds I started to take woofers. As I'm sure many of you are aware, this is an organisation who place young people from around the world seeking experience on organic farms. In return for their help, farms provide with them with board and lodge and both parties benefit. Most of them have a primary objective of improving their English language skills, but whether arriving with an interest in organic farming or not, generally took to the task with enthusiasm. I was lucky to have the marvellous woman who invented woofing, Sue Copard, come and visit us as she lives locally. I loved meeting the woofers and showing them how we lived and worked, and they brought much joy and life to what can at times be tedious and mundane tasks. I also learned much about their cultures, and now I have people I consider my children all over the world. The woofers were keen to tell me about their countries, and each had foods and produce that were special to their area. In France in particular, every region has a product that it is famous for and that they are proud of. These are protected by law. It made me think and appreciate what we have, which is a gentle climate with abundant rain, enabling us to grow grass for livestock, apples for cider, and of course, Somerset cheddar cheese and strawberries. Whilst we don't protect our produce, cheese can be sold as cheddar, whether it is made in the UK, USA or Australia. We should be proud of our farmers who are the best in the world. If Brexit does proceed after the elections, we need to ensure that our farmers have a future by providing protection against unfair competition and supermarket pricing structures. There have been a number of positive initiatives in recent years towards tackling the increasing problems of obesity and poor diet. The Soil Association has done a great job in making the public aware of the benefits of organic food and in conjunction with people like Guy Singh Watson from Riverford have been key in the increase in organic food consumption in the UK. The many small producers around the country are also vital to getting people to change their food habits away from processed convenience food to healthier and sustainable alternatives. Celebrity chefs have taken up the mantle leading to a move away from factory farm egg production and Jamie Oliver has been instrumental in getting local authorities to look at the quality of school dinners. When I lived in Wales I met an old man who remembered walking three miles to school and going all day without food because the family was so poor they had no food to send with the children. This is why school meals were invented and why I became a dinner lady. 
with junk food consumption increasing in some families school meals are a vital source of good food to many children even in an affluent city like bath children should have access to free school meals perhaps even in the school holidays it's been shown that if you spend money on the young the whole of society benefits to make significant changes in the way society view food consumption we need to introduce the concept of healthy eating to children at an early age. Prince Charles promotes the idea that gardening should be taught in school, and I fully agree, but think we should introduce children to this at nursery level. Forest schools have now become established, and by integrating organic farms into this, we could benefit future generations. When we lived in Wales, my children were taught the Welsh language in preschool, and it became second nature to them. It should be the same with growing food. As part of a holistic plan to provide a more healthy lifestyle, they should be able to play in the mud, make a den and play outside, rather than being inside, watching TV or playing virtual reality games. We have had school visits from my children and grandchildren's schools and it is a real joy and pleasure. Hopefully we have inspired someone to grow something and to know the connection between soil and their food. I love letting a child pull up a carrot and seeing their shock, surprise and delight. Our biggest obstacle at the farm has been the restricted planning rules with no long-term joined up thinking. Whilst national planning policy supports rural development at local level, there appears, appears to be no policy to su support sustainable food production and an overriding directive to obstruct any change. This has made our job as food producers very difficult when they could have worked with us for the benefit of the community. Not only have local planners subjected to every application over a 25 year period, but they even blocked the proposed use of part of the farm by a local nursery school. Hopefully, national planning policy and initiatives will eventually filter through and we can all work together to make this great country even better for our children to enjoy. As you may have guessed, I think working with nature is hugely important and everyone should save seeds and nuts and try and grow a tree. After committing much of my working life to sustain sustainable farming, it is so satisfying that demand for Castle Farm organic produce now exceeds supply. I've recently passed on responsibility for the day-to-day -day farming operation and now intend to sit back and watch the wonderful Nadia bloom and blossom in my garden. I hope I shall, however, be able to put the experience gained over the past decades to good use by mentoring the next generation of keen farmers. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Okay. Thank you very much, Joe. That's very inspiring. Thank you very much. Um, next, uh, next speaker is Jack. Jack Farmer. Jack, are you going to come up to the lectern? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've got some pretty pictures as well, so hopefully that will say. Uh, yeah, help absolutely. me out. Yeah. Um, Here we go. Great. Hi, guys. Um, my name's Jack. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Lettuce Grow. Uh, we make technology for indoor farms, so hardware and software. Um, I guess I, a lot of the, my points have been framed by previous speakers, but I guess I wanted to start with the idea that farming is a, a risky business. Um, it highlighted quite well by 2017, where well, first we had the beast from the east that froze crops in the field, and then we had that balmy, lo lovely summer that we all enjoyed. But obviously, that wrecked havoc on the crops in the fields, and I just want to touch on that as a scenario. So. What happened when we, when we got those, those, quite, those climatic issues is that because of the way the food system works in the UK, the, the one thing we cannot have is crops leave the shelves. That would be catastrophic. Um, so what actually happened is that we started flying in heads of lettuce because actually this was a European phenomenon. And we were forced to fly in about 30,000 heads of lettuce and for this particular crop a week, um, often from California, the west coast of the United States that wasn't experiencing these, these problems. Um, that's about 200 times the carbon cost in transport alone from importing into Spain and about 1,000 times UK-based production when you look at carbon. And that's uh, not just an environmental impact, that's an economic impact as well. So we've got, at that point, we're adding £45 million per week to your bills that actually lasted for about 18 months afterwards. So 
Uh, certain crops also saw a four times increase in their wholesale price. So the food system, again, is, is doing a good job. Um, but that the, the, the sad thing about this, and I guess the worrying thing about this, is that that particular climatic event um, is now considered to be about 30 times more likely due to climate change than it was 80 years ago. Uh, it, that would have been one in 245 years back in the 1920s. But now that is expected to occur once in eight years. So when you consider farming as a risky business, actually, when the risk is that high, we need to start putting in better mitigating activities. Um, and for anyone in food supply and processing, that volatility is very hard to ignore. So there are loads of different solutions to the, cli to the climatic impact upon farming. But we think, here, let us grow, that indoor farming and greenhouses are actually one of those solutions. So. Um, I touch on these, these two markets, they're two different things. Um, greenhouses, most of you have seen before. Um, vertical farms are where you stack production indoors and you use LED lighting to actually emulate the sun and provide energy to those plants. And I'll explain that in a second. Um, each of these segments are experiencing really fast growth. Um, we, as a company, believe that those markets will both play a significant part in future sustainable food production. Um, actually forming a backbone of sustainable intensification. Um, and we touched on intensification earlier. Um, these, and it's an intensification of not calorie production per se, but more the nutrient production, the, the nutrient production that we need to be healthy. Um, and doing that in a very resource efficient manner, we can control what goes into these facilities and we can do a lot in a very small space. Um, the systems don't guarantee good nutrition, but with good management, you can actually uh, guarantee a certain level of consistency. Um, I wanted to also just touch on which one of these two systems might be for you. And this, this is a new part of my presentation, so you've got you to bear with me. Um, this, as I said, this is a greenhouse. It's actually where the majority of the food uh, of, our, of certain crops that we eat in the UK comes from. So um, I'd say if you look at like a 10 year, 20 year period between 1996 and 2017, about 94% of the UK's tomatoes imports were grown in a greenhouse, much like this in either Spain or Holland. So a bit of a, a nice insight into your food system. Um, the, a vertical farm, this looks slightly, more in, slightly less green than this, but this is a technology much like this, where you stack that crop production in a certain level, up on, mu on multiple levels. Fundamentally, each of these is based around four things. Lighting, irrigation, nutrient dosing, and a certain level of environmental control. And that's really all oh, focused. It comes down to the point of actually allowing plants to convert energy into plant matter that we can consume. Very simple in that sense. Um, where is what's, but I want to just touch on the balance between these two different systems. So when you're looking at commercial scale horticulture, there's a question which is almost that is starting to emerge is, what, should I use a vertical farm or should I use a greenhouse? Um, and that's a question that all depends on resource constraints. So greenhouses are fundamentally more efficient. You can use the sunlight rather than reproducing that from electricity. But they are compromised when it comes to temperature, when it comes to water, and when it comes to land. So if you're in a place that's, if you're in Scandinavia, <coughs> you're gonna struggle to heat your greenhouse over winter if you're in the Sahara, you're going to struggle to control the water evaporating at the top of your greenhouse. And if you're in London, you're probably not going to have the space to put a greenhouse down. So there is, a, there is an equation there, and there's, these are two <coughs> complementary solutions. And that's the one point I want to emphasise here when it comes to the future of food production with these kind of systems. Um, so, yeah, I should probably touch on what we actually do as a company. I, as I put that yeah. in the middle. Um, so where does Let Us Grow fit in? Uh, we exist as a, as a technology company to enable this transition to more efficient horticultural production. We're constantly looking to reduce the carbon and the resource cost of food per kilogram. And our specialism uh, is in, well, firstly, it's in a technology called aeroponics. Now, this is where you generate a mist around plant roots. It actually provides those roots with a lot of oxygen, the same oxygen you'd get in a, uh, in a, unwater, in a normal set of soil, like well-drained soil, um, as compared to hydroponics. Hydroponics is where you flow water over those roots and is often analogous, I would say, to 
uh, overwatered clay soil, if you like. The roots don't have enough oxygen to breathe and the plants don't grow as fast as a result. So we're bringing this technology to market in the greenhouse industry and improving uh, yields, water efficiency, and as a result, the predictability and the, and the economics of horticultural institutions around the country and around increasingly around the world. Um, I also wanted to touch on a second piece of technology that we do develop as well, because it is a very holistic piece, these kind of systems, and that is our software, um, Astara. Um, what this essentially does is this assists the grower with the management of their greenhouse. So it essentially does three things. It helps you integrate with your supply chain. So if you have crops going out of your facility, you can easily manage and track those crops going to your customer. It reduces the cost of your operations, so we can do things like reduce your energy bill by managing when you utilise certain components versus the price of energy on the market. And we actually also enable you to control your heating and ventilation, your lighting, your irrigation, all from one place, which is not actually standard. So that all comes, and basically that all comes together into a package that really enables you to be much more efficient when running these kind of facilities. And we're also working with loads of different partners, so partners in traceability of produce, partners in actually uh, energy optimization of these facilities as well, to make sure that we really add value throughout these facilities. Now, I would note that it's not just lettuce, despite the name, and I will take, I will take ownership of that name. That was my wonderful idea at the start of the company. But um, yeah, it's not just lettuce. We, we, we work in uh, strawberries. We work across basically any crop that you can imagine growing in a greenhouse. That's, that's our purview. As I said, it's nutritious uh, kind of production of vegetables that we really focus on as a company. Um, so I wanted to get to, I guess, the point. Um, I, I wanted to rattle through that quite quickly, hopefully. Hopefully you understand where, where I'm coming from um, with regards to technology. And I think um, hopefully present an interesting complementary viewpoint to some of some, what the panel have said today. Um, I would I, thinking about this earlier today, I wanted to propose three points. So there's a lot of, um, I guess, fear when you look at the climate emergency. And there's a lot of necessity for increasing food production to actually feed a lot of people without ruining the climate. And I would suggest that on a first level that we should, a bit like, a bit like Gandalf in Lord of the Rings, we should look east first, actually, actually southeast slightly. Um, and we should look to the Dutch first if you're looking to actually increase food production because they are currently the second biggest global exporter of food by, by dollar value to the US. And um, I was checking these numbers earlier and there's, there's a really good National Geographic article on this with regards to greenhouse production. But um, currently, the, I believe the Dutch are, are producing about 990,000 tonnes of tomatoes within what is actually a cumulative squ seven square mile radius, which is, quite frankly, astounding on an annual basis. Um, the, I'm not saying that we should all become Holland, because there are a lot of greenhouses. Um, but that, that model is eminently exportable. It's, it's a model that you can spread around the world and you can utilise to massively ramp up nutritious food production. And it's a model that may prove complementary in part to the UK as we, as we move into these uh, quite new and uncertain <coughs> times. Um, I, I think the secondary, the secondary point I wanted to make alongside that, that tip of my hat to greenhouses um, is that imports can be substituted. There's a, um, it's variable crop by crop, but there is a significant import to export balance on a lot of vegetables. Uh, in favour of importing things into the UK rather than growing, uh, kind of home growing our own, our own food supply. And a lot of that is climate linked. It's, it's quite hard to grow lettuce over winter in the UK, for example. Um, but that there are technology improvements that, and that will enable this year round production that are really hitting the commercial markets over this next year. Uh, this vertical farming production that I've spoken about enables you to grow all year round. So it's a massive, it could have a real massive positive impact upon the out of season production of vegetables that might otherwise need to be flown, flown in from North Africa or shipped in from North Africa on a quite an elongated and wasteful supply chain. 
Um, there's similar improvements in actually integration of greenhouses with combined heat and power plants that will enable you to grow over winter without actually having, ex without, well, without sending your heating bills through the roof. Um, and so I, I really cause for hope there and a cause for, I guess, real engagement and interest in horticulture um, within the farming sector. Um, and then lastly, uh, well, I guess my point for consideration is that the, the Dutch model is not necessarily the UK model. I think what we need to do is to really consider this as a part of a holistic UK model for agriculture. Like you said, there's, we need to look at what suits our land and what suits our soil and how can we efficiently meet demand without compromising a lot of the, the great things about UK agriculture that was we've spoken about. And um, I, I can only offer opinion here, but uh, the, uh, I believe that the, the utilisation of, of this kind of horticulture in either peri-urban um, and brown, brownfield sites around, around major cities can really complement some of the rural um, agroecology that we've spoken about earlier today, because often people who live in cities are dissociated from the countryside and do just want cheap food. And actually, there are ways to deliver that food from the edge of the cities directly into the cities in a very resource efficient manner. And I do believe that will be part of the solution um, alongside actually some of the, the regeneration that hopefully will go along in the countryside. Um, that does leave space in, the, in this patchwork of solutions for cereals um, um, and calorific production. Um, and I've just written, who need help? Um, so, so anyone who's interested in, in cereals, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't help on that one. Um, and then uh, lastly, I just wanted to leave on, uh, end on this slide, which my co-founder Charlie happily put together a few, a, few, a few weeks ago. And actually, I think this does actually sum it up from my perspective, um, particularly when speaking to people in the agricultural sector. Uh, we've had a really exciting period, really, in the last 20 years of diversification. Um, there's, you see a lot more farms with solar panels, with anaerobic digesters uh, on their land at the moment, and they are delivering valuable services to the, wide, the wider nation. What we believe is that this indoor farming and horticultural production is actually part of a much more efficient whole system that can be implemented alongside anaerobic digestion and renewable energy. We can use the CO2 and the heat from the anaerobic digestion parts to make our farms much more efficient. We can sink solar and, solar and wind energy into those farms when the grid doesn't require it. And actually, all that does is it drops your cost of production much lower and it enables farmers to keep farming, which I believe is always a good thing. So um, thank you for listening. Uh, hopefully we have a good discussion. And uh, yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you very much indeed, Jack. And our final speaker is Patrick Holden. Patrick. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, just before we started uh, the discussions tonight, um, uh, my ex-colleague, Joe Lewis, said, well, it looks as a, if we're going to agree about everything. Maybe you could find a way to uh, disagree with one or two of the points that were made. And um, I think Joe would agree. I'm, I'm, I'm her man because uh, <laughs> I've, got, I've got form in this. <laughs> of being disruptive. It's actually, I do agree with most of the points that have um, been made by all the other panellists, but I'm a bit of a disruptor, um, as I think Phil and Joe will agree during the, the years that I spent at the Soil Association until 2009, when I set off on my own to set up a new organisation, the Sustainable Food Trust, uh, whose mission has been uh, described, accelerating the transition towards more sustainable food systems working globally and um, if, if time permits and if these slides can be loaded because uh, I found the one that I think might work I, I might just share you some pictures at the end of what I say about my farm in Wales because I'm practicing what I preach on my farm and have been for the last 40 plus years on a farm in West Wales uh, but before I get to that um, what I would like to my response to the challenge that we're all facing is that uh, we need within 10 years to transform our food and farming systems to operate within planetary boundaries, meaning within the carrying capacity of the planet, because at the moment our farming systems are far exceeding uh, 
that it's carrying capacity in, in lots of different areas, including greenhouse gas emissions, as has been mentioned, biodiversity loss, uh, soil loss, growing food insecurity, et cetera, et cetera. And the question is, what is the nature of the farming and food system which needs to replace the present unsustainable one? And what are the barriers which are preventing that change from happening fast enough? And my organization, the Sustainable Food Trust, is based in uh, Bristol, uh, but we do operate internationally. And amongst the work that we've done, uh, we've identified two of the barriers about which I wish to speak with you this evening. Uh, the first of the barrier is a dishonest economic system which distorts food pricing uh, because of the absence of what economists would call internalization of external costs, or in simpler words, the absence of the polluter pays principle. And basically what's been happening during the whole of my farming lifetime is that farmers have not been financially accountable for the negative impacts of the farming systems they've been practicing. So through no fault of their own, it's paid to farm intensively and it hasn't paid to farm sustainably. And during my time at the Soil Association, I was one of the sort of co-architects of the development of the organic standards. I actually wrote the world's first draft of the organic dairy standards back in the 80s. And what we were trying to do, a bunch of hippies as we were then who got back to the land, I, I'm a Londoner who got back to the land to West Wales in the, in the 70s, we couldn't make sustainable farming pay, so we thought, well, why not write the prescription on the back of an envelope of a more sustainable farming system, take our story to the public, and hope that they would support us in the marketplace. And that, in short, is the story of the development of the organic standards and the organic market. But what we didn't see then was that we were up against an economic headwind so strong that even if we charged a 20 or 30% premium, or even more in the case of chicken, maybe up to 400%, we still were not going to be able to overcome the massive economic advantages of not being accountable for the pollution and the damage that intensive farming causes, as a result of which the organic market is only 2%, 2.5%, whatever it is in the UK at the moment. And yet the demand on us now, as all the recent reports uh, have recently concluded, is that we have to change all our food and farming systems, not just here in the UK, but globally, to get inside planetary boundaries within the next 10 to 15 years. Otherwise, we're going to face irreversible climate change, ecological catastrophe, food migration conflicts, and all the other unthinkable, unbearable things. And yet, the change is not happening. So one of the focuses of work that the, Solis, the Sustainable Food Trust has focused on is true cost accounting. And we produced, in service of that work, a, a report called the Hidden Costs of UK Food. This was produced in, in 2017, but we just upgraded it recently. And the headline conclusion of this report is for every pound we spend on food in the shops, there's another hidden pound in damage to the environment and damage to public health, split approximately 50-50. And this means that we're not really, when we buy a cheap chicken or a cheap anything, we're not paying the true cost of that food. Whereas the food which hasn't got these hidden costs associated to it, the cheap food, it seems to be compellingly cheap and affordable. And of course, that's what most people buy, understandably. And if you look before the farm gate, if a farmer, for instance, buys a kilogram of nitrogen, let's say they spend, it doesn't matter what they spend, but let's say they spend a pound on it. They put it on the land and they get three pounds worth of yield. So there's a business case for using nitrogen fertilizer. But if you cost in all the environmental damage done by that kilogram of nitrogen fertilizer, the emissions, the nitrates that get into the water, the air quality problem, which is causing uh, respiratory diseases, it wipes out, the cost of that wipes out the advantage of using it and it probably wipes it out, more than wipes it out, it would be prohibitive to use it. But we don't have a nitrogen tax. The polluter is not paying because governments perceive that to be um, a, 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 if, the, if the government in the current election was saying, well, we're going to tax um, inputs in agriculture which cause damage to the environment and public health, that would put up the price of food and that would seem, be seen to be electorally undesirable. So the number one, I would say the single principal barrier to the transition to the food systems we need to replace the ones we have at the moment is uncosted negative externalities. And 
The only way we're going to put that right is if you, we, the citizens, understand the need for the application of the polluter pays principle in food and farming as we have already done more or less in climate change and we become an electoral force which forces the, the politicians who will only do what it takes to get them elected understandably um, to introduce these polluter pays taxes. There are discussions about this in the Treasury there's a chap called uh, Professor Dieter Helm again at Oxford University whose name who uh, Oxford University has already come up uh, this evening, who is an advocate for the, uh, this application. But the question is, will it happen? It, till it happens, we're locked into a system of really commodity slavery for farmers, where farmers are act, uh, operating at or below the cost of production, producing these foods which cause vast damage to the environment and public health. No one gains, and yet we, we carry on with the system because we don't see this, this issue. The second barrier to change relates to public confusion about the fundamental and central question which I suspect is in, on the back of all our minds here tonight. What should I eat to be healthy and sustainable? And a series of reports, most of which have all concluded that we're on the, reverse, the edge of irreversible climate change and our food and farming systems are part of the problem and could be part of the solution, have all come out in the last year or two and most of them I would respectfully su suggest to you, are pretty fundamentally wrong on some of the key issues. They're right on the fact that there's a big problem, but in my opinion, and in the opinion of the Sustainable Food Trust, they are causing a lot of confusion and worse in their advocacy of how we should behave as citizens to adjust our diets to the output of sustainable farming systems. And that would be my recommendation for discussion with you. In answer to my own question, what should I eat to be sustainable and healthy, my answer is that we should eat, I should eat, the output of a UK farming system, because that's near to where I live, the country where I live or the region where I live, uh, which is converted to sustainable food production, which begs the question, if the whole of the United Farm Kingdom was farmed in a sustainable way, what would we produce and what proportions of the food from our sustainably farmed landscape would we be able to eat? And although we are intending and we are planning to do a study, a sort of death study, imagining this transition and looking at the, uh, the resultant um, output, here's a, a, a very oversimplified summary of what this would be. We are a nation of grassland. Uh, Two-thirds of the United Kingdom is grassland. Um, if the farming systems of the United Kingdom were converted to sustainable production, uh, we'd have to give up the use of nitrogen fertiliser altogether in time. We'd have to wean ourselves off it, cold turkey, but basically we need to get rid of it. The only way that farmers can build fertility, which is what's necessary in a farming system which doesn't use nitrogen, is to go into a crop rotation which has a fertility building phase, and that's probably... 40 or 50% of the total rotation, during which time it's in grass and clover because that's the best way to build soil fertility. So in a sustainably farmed Britain, the amount of grassland in the eastern counties and the, area, the arable areas of the United Kingdom would actually increase, and that would mean that we'd have an even greater decrease of grain production than we would if we just gave up using the nitrogen fertiliser, which, as has already been said, means that we have to give up eating grain-fed livestock products because it would probably at least halve the output of grains in the UK if we switched to sustainable production. So if I'd asked you before this discussion, and Joe's already mentioned this, what is the least unsustainable meat to eat? In other words, if you're worried about what David Attenborough and everybody else says about cutting down on meat, your answer would probably be, well, I think chicken's probably the, the, the meat of choice because it hasn't got the emissions, and it's, people are saying, people like Tim Lang are saying, uh, eat more chicken, eat less red meat. They're wrong. Basically, we should give up eating intensive chicken altogether. We should give up eating intensively produced pork altogether. Joe's made these points. But conversely, we need, if we're going to eat the food that comes from a sustainably farmed Britain, to eat not the same amount of grass-fed and mainly grass-fed, but more. And the result of us not doing that is that there is a crisis going on right now um, in the livestock sector of this country, and I'm sure Phil will agree with this. Um, beef consumption in the last 
uh, 12 months has dropped by 15%. It, it's it had already dropped by 50% since the 1980s when the Coma report, which was a government report recommending saying that animal fats were bad for you, completely changed the British diet. And now things are even worse. And the livestock sector is absolutely, they don't know what to do. I mean, I'm, I'm farming in the middle of a Welsh farming community, which is 90% grass, more than that even. Actually, we're growing arable crops, but most of our neighbours aren't. They don't know what to do. And the, the tragedy of it is that we, society, are failing to differentiate between the livestock systems, which are part of the problem, which Joe's already highlighted, and those which are emphatically not part of the just part of the solution, like the sheep farming in this country, but absolutely essential if we're going to recarbonize the soils, which 60 years of intensive farming have depleted, and rebuild this carbon store, which could take various estimates are that you could take up to 100 parts per million of CO2 up out of the atmosphere and re-sequester it in the soils of this country, not just through rewilding, so I'm going to have a go at George Monbiot in a minute, um, uh, but through sustainable farming. Now, on the subject of rewilding, yes, it would be lovely to reforest some of our land, but George Monbiot, who has visited my farm in 20, 2007, has advocated, he's been particularly tough on lamb, and uh, I think unreasonably so, um, and I think his advocacy of sustainable intensification, which means, you know, <coughs> growing more food on the best agricultural land and rewilding the, le the rest, is also wrong. I'm up against him on the food programme in two weeks, and I'm doing the head-to-head um, -head with him uh, in London next Monday, so you'll, you'll be the judge of uh, this discussion with George of whom I've been a great fan because of his leadership on climate change stuff, but I, who I think is pretty fundamentally wrong on this issue of what we should eat to be healthy and sustainable. And if you look at the impact of these succession of reports, Joe mentioned the Eat Lancet report, there's one that came out two weeks ago, the Folly of Food and Land Use report, and with the exception of the IDRI report, and I agree with Joe on this, most of the reports have advocated a plant-based diet and they've tended to advocate more consumption of chicken than they have of red grass-fed and mainly grass-fed red meat. This is causing, this is making it impossible for the farmers of this country, and I would argue farmers all over the world, to transition to truly sustainable farming systems. So this is not a small point, it's a huge point. And what we need to do in response to this is we need to become knowledgeable about the difference between not just the livestock systems, but also the plant systems, which are part of the problem and those which are part of the solution. So why would we just talk about meat as if it was something bad and not mention plants? Again, this point's been made. Genetically modified soy, palm oil, almonds from the Central Valley in California. Yes, lettuce too. These plants we shouldn't be eating, but there are plants that we should be eating and we could produce these in, in this country in a sustainable fashion. Um, there's more I could say, but I'd better not, because there's a discussion. I'd love to show you some pictures of my farm. Maybe I can just run through them. I'm going to show you 90 miles an hour. Uh, this, this is our farm policy. You won't be able to read it. This is me. On, uh, there's a hippie on a tractor in 73. Um, we were still producing milk in churns then. There's me and my firstborn. Here's the farm today. We're producing cheese. Havod Cheese Instagram, H-A-F-O-D. Follow us on Instagram. Uh, there's our dairy herd. We're farming in harmony with nature. We've never used a single kilogram of nitrogen fertilizer in 46 years. And this is the result. We're farming holistic grazing, regenerative grazing, grazing for 24 hours and moving the cattle on. There's making silage because we gave up big bales. There's the cows grazing clover. There's the herd in the field. There they are going to brass. <laughs> There's beautiful dandelions, which are part of the biodiversity of the pasture, which happens when you don't use nitrogen fertilizer. There's more clover. Isn't it beautiful? There's red clover, also wonderful and a great nitrogen fixer, making silage, uh, tedding it, there's the shed again. Uh, dr <laughs> drilling corn, there it is coming up. We grow oats and peas and barley in a mix and we feed it as cow muesli. So we're trying to be self-sufficient, we're practicing the circular economy, we believe in the law of return. All farms should be managing their ecosystems. There's the peas in the oats and barley crop, combining straw, grain in our newly erected silo, which you saw at the beginning, uh, peas in it, biodiversity, that's coppicing, 
Uh, there's our milking parlour. That used to be Rachel's Surrey. We suckle all our, our heifer calves. So we try to nurse... We don't, we don't bucket feed any of our heifer calves because that's better for them. They live longer. There's our have or cheese in the store. More of it. There it is ironing. There's the vat. It used to be in Montgomery's vat, interestingly enough. The Montgomery cheddar vat. But they got bigger. And there's the cheddaring process. And there's me. I used to be a carrot grower. Tried to grow carrots. This is important. All the... Uh, slaughterhouses, packing houses and distribution centres that supply the supermarkets that we buy the food from, they all got centralised so there was only one pack house, one slaughterhouse, one meat cutting plant left for each commodity that the supermarkets sell. We used to sell carrots to Sainsbury's and Waitrose but they closed down all the pack houses, there was only one left which was in Peterborough so we had to give up. And that's the story of commodity production and intensification. We have to reverse that. We need to develop relocalized food systems. We can be the change because if we use our buying power to, grow, to buy in season staple crops from as near as possible to where we live, uh, obviously we're going to ha have imports as well because we're not structurally self-sufficient. Uh, self but if we did that, and if each person here used their buying power to buy those foods, the world would change and we get inside planetary boundaries within 10 years, but we've got to act. I'll stop. Okay, well, fantastic. So we've got a bit of time for uh, debate and discussion. Uh, there are a couple of roving mics, my colleagues uh, on both sides of the aisles, ready to take... Uh, Questions. I say what I'll do. I'll take I'll take three questions in one go to begin because I want to try and squeeze a lot in, and then just address address them to who you want on the panel. And I'll get the panel to respond. So first up here, yeah. Hi. Um, I wanted to pick up on the points made about rewilding. I think there's a false dichotomy presented between food versus nature, and wanted to ask um, the panel members for their view on um, the wild farming systems um, such as being developed in the Nether State in West Sussex. Okay, thanks very much. Let's go a bit further up back there. Yeah. Yeah, two together up there. Yeah, that'd be great. Hello. I'm a fairly standard, omnivorous, green leaving leaning member of the public. A few months ago, I was wanting to find some pasture-fed dairy products. Milk, cream, cheese. I couldn't find any certification that was there to guarantee that what I was buying was pasture fed. In fact, the more I looked at it, the more I found almost deliberate confusion being fed to the public about the difference between semi-intensive grass and pasture fed animals. Is there any certification system in place if there's not, why not? Something along the Soil Association Organics or the American <coughs> Grass-Fed Associations certification for actual pasture-fed meat products. Okay, thanks very much. And then, yeah. Notwithstanding that we might be leaving the EU, I wondered whether you had any indication if the EU agricultural policy was moving towards a more sustainable model. Okay. Okay, well, let's, let's take that, that set of questions. Um, and hey, perhaps, Joe, I can ask you about the certification of pasture fed first off. Do you happen to know the. Or does anybody There's a pasture know? fed livestock association. Phil, you probably know more about yeah. that. You? Yeah, I do. Uh, there is an organisation here in the UK called the Pasture Fed Livestock Association, and they do just that certify pasture fed and 100% pure pasture fed beef and lamb. Okay. Uh, they, they were trying to get into dairy products, but you might be able to add a little bit on that. But they were developing the standards for dairy products as well. Just continuing on the theme of disruptive comments, but not meaning against any of the existing certification schemes, I think it is immensely confusing and almost impossible to use the existing certification schemes, arguably with the exception of organic, to be a guide to what we, I was advocating, namely eating sustainably. And I think the problem with the Pasture for Life label is that that's just one aspect of sustainability. And what we need really is a, a labelling scheme which embraces all the aspects of sustainability. And what, I won't, didn't have time to talk about it, but the Sustainable Food Trust is developing what we hope will become 
an internationally harmonised framework for farm sustainability assessment. And this would result in, and we've got 10 categories, soil, water, biodiversity, crop, livestock management, um, nutrient cycling, energy and resource use, social and cultural impact. Each of those will be scored with metrics, and then you could have a scoring system out of 100, say, which, let's take my farm, let's say I'd score 71. Part of that would be for the pasture-fed aspect of my dairy cows, but it wouldn't necessarily be 100%, which is another point, which is the trouble with the pasture for life label is it's either 100% or it's, we're not eligible. My dairy farm wouldn't be eligible because we feed that muesli that I was talking about. So I would rather, if I was a consumer, know a bit about all those elements of sustainability and use my buying power accordingly. And what's very interesting is that the Welsh Government are going to introduce this framework for an annual sustainability audit for every farm in Wales probably from 2020 or 21 onwards. And we hope that that will go connect up with the labelling scheme. So when I'm inspected to be organic, I will say to Helen Browning, or actually the head of the inspection, here's my audit. You make a decision about whether I'm organic. So I'm not anti the organic label, but I think that we need to make sense of all these labelling schemes with some, some, something yeah. which integrates them. And this shouldn't just be in the UK. It should be across the world. OK, thanks very much, Patrick. Um, can, can, no, sorry, can I, can I just move on? I, I, I don't, you did have your question, and we're quite, we're quite busy. So, Joe, just to ask you uh, on the dichotomy on rewilding, is that an issue that... Uh, can you just ask, answer, address yeah, that for uh, Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that was raised, actually. So, um, I think it's, it's really important that we don't get trapped into uh, setting um, food production against rewilding, that, that, that it's absolutely clear um, that we need to bring nature back onto farms. Uh, uh, which is what agroecology is all about, and organic farming stands for. Um, but we also, and there's no way we're going to reverse global insect declines unless we do that, but that, that does not exclude, preclude, space for habitat restoration and rewilding. So, for instance, in the, um, the IDRI model I, I, I mentioned in terms of um, land being transitioned, um, all farmland being transitioned to agroecology, 10% uh, of that land, it assumes, is rewilded, if you like, for habitat restoration. I think it's also important to talk about bringing trees back onto farms and not set farming against forestry. Agroforestry has huge potential, um, and there's also um, a lo lot of economic potential for farm farmers getting behind the farm woodland economy as well. So yes, we cannot afford to continue down what's been a, a really um, negative land sparing debate about you know, we have to intense, ever intensify farming farming on one side to spare land for nature, to spare land for trees. That hasn't worked for nature. It certainly hasn't worked for tree planting. We need to bring the trees and the nature back onto farms. Has anybody got anything to, to add on the, on the question of the common agricultural policy? Uh, are things getting more sustainable? Neil? Well, yeah. I, I would say one thing that the common agricultural has given us that we need in our new agricultural bill, and that is longevity. I mean, we were working within seven or eight year financial cycles. And at the moment, our agricultural bill is looking at single year cycles or possibly parliamentary terms. And that does not give the, the, the length of term, the longevity, the security that, that uh, a long term farming business needs. Okay, can, let's. Can, let's I, can I make a point about the CAP? Because very quickly, Patrick. The, weird, the accident of Brexit, which I personally feel desperately depressed about, uh, has had one silver lining, which is that it's caused a fundamental review of the present system of rewarding farmers. We get £80 an acre, just more or less social security payment for being a farmer at the moment. And Michael Gove and the most, well, especially the Welsh Government, they realise that this is not the way ahead. And what we are advocating for is to keep the money in farming, but to pay it to farmers for sustainable land management, not the stewardship schemes around the edge of otherwise sustainably, uh, unsustainably managed land. And we've made a great deal of headway. We were making headway with Michael Gove, because we're all his... My, disagreements with him. I think he did a good job when he was at DEFRA. But the Welsh Government are going to introduce this approach to yeah. rewarding uh, farming, sustainable farming, which is really exciting. And I think Brussels are looking the same way. So it's not as if the EU is the enemy of this. They, just been, they were just held back in the past. In part, it has to be said, by the British, who basically argued against the greening of the cap. OK, let's, um, let's take some more questions then. And we've got a couple here, yeah? If we could go, yeah. Let's do three in the middle here. And questions to J Jack and uh, Joe Edwards as well, please. Um, yeah, uh, I'm a, a local vineyard grower, uh, organic, ever since we started 17 years ago. Um, the, my issue is on the word sustainability. A few years ago, on the part of the National 
uh, Weinberg Association, we were looking at sustainability yes. issues. And part of that research, I uh, looked up the, uh, the uh, how it's done in, uh, in uh, New Zealand, South Africa, and uh, especially New Zealand, who made their, uh, their name and wine, calling it um, sustainable. And this really confused the public is that what is sustainable? How long, how far does it go? And what Patrick has just said is nice, to, is good to hear. But um, we need to have some sort of legislation, um, interpretation is uh, sustainable only until the money runs out on a farm. Okay, thanks very much. And then coming along, yeah. Um, following on from the previous uh, person's contribution about sustainable, um, I'm really concerned about... The, it's a bit of a weasel word, really, isn't it? Because nobody here... I'm going to really get unpopular now. Nobody has mentioned... Um, everybody's talking about how much they love the animals that they kill and eat, and we're supposed to kill and eat. Um, as an ethical vegan, um, I'm now looking at um, a study that was done by Joseph Poor, University of Oxford, four-year meta-analysis. OK, so he's talking about... Without meat and dairy consumption, global farm farmland use could be reduced by more than 75%. And he talks about how when he started this study, this four-year meta-analysis, which involved 40,000 farms in 119 countries and covering 40 food products, he kind of thought that what you're talking about, the grass-fed sort of like, you know, beef, was yay, the answer. Um, Basically, it's not. The comparison of beef with plant proteins such as peas is stark, with even the lowest impact beef responsible for six times more greenhouse gases and 36 times okay. more land. So, um, so, okay, so yeah. the case for so, veganism. So, yeah. Okay. yeah, the case is, and okay. he said that basically he, went, he started off trying to prove your points that, you know, okay. grass fed was the, the thing. He went vegan at the end of this four year meta analysis. Okay. Joseph Poor. Thanks very much. And then behind you, yeah. Hi, um, I was just wondering if any of the panellists had any strong opinions either way on letting omnivorous livestock like pigs and chickens eat our food waste again. Okay, food, food waste. Okay, let, let's take another round while, while we let our panel think about some of those answers to some of those things. I've got a lady up there, yep, and then over here. Marsha, if you could go there, that'd be great. Hi, thank you. Um, I... Uh, coordinated a campaign a few years ago in Bristol um, to protect Bristol's only bit of grade one agricultural land from becoming a park and ride, uh, the blue finger as it's known. And, and I'm really interested in ways that we can um, make, overcome the problem of access to land for new entrants to farming. And um, I'm interested in exploring the idea of a sort of bioregional scale um, land trust or community land trust into which um, public bodies of all kinds can gift or transfer land assets to enable um, food production to start upscaling and land workers to start the land worker force to start increasing uh, to provide per purposeful long-term work mm. and also to um, rebuild the nature recovery network through food growing and that combining of uses like yeah. you were saying about nature and food growing and trees. Great. Um, so I'm interested in your thoughts on that, uh, on a bioregional land trust, community land trust. Thanks very much. And up here next, yeah. Hi, um, stand up. My name's Lydia. Um, I've done research on uh, horticultural production out of season in Almeria and um, Morocco mm -hmm. actually. Um, my concern is around, um, so the, I have two questions um, for, about things that for me are missing in this debate. The first is about workers. Um, so obviously there's not just farmers but workers uh, on the land and like the previous person mentioned, mm. um, it would be good to see how we can make farming, intensive farming pay not just uh, farmers but also workers. Um, and I don't think that the solution um, is intensification. Actually, um, often the workers that I've interviewed are suffering the effects of intensification, yeah. suffer the effects of systems that are made to perhaps keep tomatoes cool, but maybe that makes the workers cold. Um, you know, the, to, to, and, and that's why I think that the agri agroecological direction of, of 
you know, finding ways to pay for people incorporated into food systems rather than to just simply reduce the highest cost of uh, food, which is uh, often labour, um, by removing people from food systems is the answer. But anyway, workers is my main question. What, what is the future of workers in the UK? And secondly, nobody's mentioning really subsidies. Um, so clearly there's this huge pot of money that's being relocated to the UK. Will it just be uh, spent by different sections of um, our government who don't seem to be placing agriculture in um, kind of in their priorities, or how can we make sure that they carry on paying for um, food, the kind of food that we'd like to eat? Thank you very much, it's been great. Okay, so yeah, post-Brexit subsidy system. I've got one more down here, and then I'm going to ask each of the panel members just to reply to whatever they want to pick up from those points in the, in the very short time we have left. So one, one more here, yeah, thank you. Um, this is to Jack. Um, sorry, I had to write it down because it's quite a long question. Okay. Um, if we farm organically and regeneratively with livestock fully integrated into the farming system, we have an opportunity to create healthy soil which sequesters carbon, mm -hmm. creates a rich and diverse home for microorganisms and worms, etc., um, creates a rich ecosystem, a soil which is nutrient dense and subsequently feeds our plants with lots of nutrients which once eaten feed us with high nutrient dense food. Why then would we use hydroponics, which houses itself as completely separate to this intricately linked and fully sustainable food system, and feeds the demands of a broken system, like the out-of-season demands for lettuce, tomatoes, etc., um, rather than supporting the farms and farmers and the soil, which actually already house um, the soil, which already holds all of the answers. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Okay, I'm going to start okay. here then, John, and work my way down the oh, table, yeah. uh, picking up, yeah, and Jack, that one's for you directly, and also, I think, also for both Joe and Jack, actually, this question also of farm workers or workers in agriculture and food production systems. But let me start with you, Joe. Uh, let me pick up on the question about uh, feeding food waste to pigs. Um, it's absolutely essential. I, I should talk about not just grass-fed, but actually, um, it was a whole appendix of the Eat Lancet Commission report, which was called Livestock on Leftovers. Um, and that's the best way of it. It's feeding, when we're feeding animals, we should feed them non-human edible food. So that's grass, which is a left, it's not something we can eat. Two thirds of our farmland is grass. That's very efficient, um, but also is absolutely crucial to be fat feeding food waste um, to pigs. Um, and I, uh, I understand that a lot of the technical food safety barriers that have been posed to that um, are on the verge of being overcome. Um, there's been some fantastic research done by Feedback Global, who founded the pig idea and have always been champions of this, um, but were perhaps guilty of being a bit woolly on the issue, um, have done three good years of research for the European Commission on this, and a lot of the technical barriers are being overcome, so that's looking very encouraging. Uh, I, could, I could hold forth on all sorts of these yeah. <laughs> no, no, questions. No. So I know Let, what okay, let's, let's keep going now. Thank you. Um, yeah. That lady up there, I've got big fear that the councils are selling off the farms. Like the average age of a British farmer now is my age. We don't need people my age. We need the young people. We need young people to be clever and find the answers for this. But there aren't places for young people to farm. Yeah. So I don't know what the answer is. Gorilla gardening getting big money to buy farms and rent it to people. I don't know, you know, maybe taxes could do that. Another thing is, years ago we used to eat differently. I think you're supposed to eat like your granny used to eat. We never saw meat like you see meat now. When my granddaughter started school, she turned around and said, oh, will there be a menu? I didn't know there was such a thing as a menu until I was an adult. We used to have a bit of meat and we, it would last a week. I think we've got to go back to that, you know. Lamb is the most delicious food in the world. I've only got to see a sheep and I feel hungry. But you would have... We need to make that... You know, it's a real treat. You would, you would stretch that piece of meat and it, you'd have lovely veggies. You'd look in the fridge, what's going manky? Shove that in quick. That's the ladies that we work together. We would open the fridge and what was there is what we would make a meal for. Now people think, oh, I'm going to make a flambéed or whatever. <laughs> but we had hungry kids. We all fed people with what was available. We'd go out in the garden, pick a few beans. You know, you stretch it, you make it work. It's a and then you feed what the kids won't eat or the dog won't eat. You feed it to the pig or the chickens. You know, that, that's what people, I think, have got to go back to. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah, Jack. Cool. I, I think that... Yeah, I guess. <laughs> <Popular answer. laughs> yeah, <clears throat> I think that those, both of your questions go to the heart of actually what, 
where does where does horticulture need to go over the next the next few years? I, I guess I'll work up if that's right. Um, so your question regarding soil versus hydroponics, a very valid one. Um, you, the thing to understand about any greenhouse or horticulture system is that it's not inherently organic or inorganic. It depends what you put in it, actually. So a lot of um, Didn't the Chinese used to have fish at the bottom? Yeah, you can do. You can have aquaponic systems. And then it's a whole yeah. circle because yeah, things need to be circular, don't they? You don't yeah. just shove things in. Yeah. There's that's right. Well, this is the thing, because a lot of the systems uh, that you see, I mean, your potted herbs are grown in peat, often a mixture of peat and perlite, which is inherently unsustainable. That's natural land. But actually, there's no reason why you can't actually replace that with um, properly treated digestate, anaerobic digestion plants, which actually closes the loop on nutrition and actually takes uh, digestate that would otherwise be given away and turns it into nutritious food. So I think... the. You shouldn't see, I personally wouldn't, um, as a plant scientist, see there to be a true differentiation between soil and hydroponics. The plant in that situation will merely take up the nutrients from its surrounding environment. Your soil could be laced with copper in a, in a, in a, in a field, or it could be in this digestate in a, in a farm. It, what it really calls for is an understanding of what goes into a horticultural system. Where do your seeds come from? Where do your nutrients come from? Where do your matter? Where does your kind of consumables come from? If they are from good locations and of knowable providence, and as we talked about, that level of understanding as to what goes into the system is super important, then actually these horticulture systems can have a huge part to play in the transition that's coming. We, we need something to be able to scale up certain aspects of food production in the next 10 to 15 years. This is a way of doing that. It's one way and it has to be done right. And I also wanted to address the, la the labour point because I think that's super important. Um, yeah. So the, yeah, the working conditions now, Maria, are quite frankly horrific in many locations. Um, that is, I think there are examples of good and bad practice in all industries. I would say that the subsidy point is one of real interest. It should be understood that this indoor farming and greenhouse farming industry is not subsidised in the UK. Th those subsidies, if applied in the right way, could be utilised to actually address some of that pay payment considerations you're looking at. But fundamentally, the <coughs> I think a lot of the problems you see in those horticultural systems are driven by supermarket pricing forcing down the cost of production and actually allow, therefore, labour being squeezed and working conditions <coughs> being squeezed. So we need to address that very human problem okay. uh, in order to make these systems work in a human manner. OK, thanks, Jack. But Patrick, a lot of your fellow hippies in the 70s became vegans. Yeah, they did, yeah. Um, What's the answer to the vegan? Yeah. Well, question? I'll come to that. Sustainable definition, I just want to pick up. I agree, we, you've got to... You can't use the word sustainability without defining it, and that's what we're trying to do. So, you know, your point is right about the wooliness of the word, but it can be defined, and that's what we're trying to do. Food waste to pigs, I completely agree with Joe. The vegan issue, it's very complicated, and Joseph Bloor, who's one of the, the, one of the sort of um, advocates of veganism, who, as was just said, he converted to veganism when he'd done this study. It's, there's not time to go into this, but I seriously think he doesn't understand agriculture, and he was misinformed. Um, that's the summary, but obviously you, we need to debate the science. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I know him. I've met him. I've debated with him on. Uh, yeah, I've, I've talked to him on radio stuff, and, but he doesn't understand the the the, the, the cycle of ruminants. The, the he he's it's t it's just too much information for people to say in thirty seconds. I will simply say that it's a critically important issue. And there was a large, the Eat Lancet report had 37 authors. None of them were practitioners. I would say none of them really understood agriculture. And I think you need to understand agriculture to pronounce on what future diets are. And jo Joseph is amongst that crowd of academics who are telling us what we should eat without understanding agriculture. That's the summary, but Phil will probably talk about that. The blue finger land <laughs> and um, the, the whole thing about horticultural workers, I, agree, I think that they should be subsidised in the future. It would be really right use of public money to grow more vegetables. However, the contentious bit, I don't think the hydroponic vegetables in the long term will form part of, should form part of our future diets. They already do form our diets. All the salads crops that are sold in UK supermarkets 
are already 100%, apart from the organic ones, they're 100% hydroponic. But nutrient density in food is best when it's an interaction between the plant and the soil, because plants derive many of their micronutrients and phytonutrients from a soil-based interaction in the root zone. It's like our stomach. The soil is the stomach of the plant. And then the last thing, the, well, I guess that is the last thing, actually, on my list. <laughs> I, I don't necessarily disagree with you, yeah. particularly on in-season vegetables. I think there's a, there's a dietary shift that really yeah. needs to move towards in-season production. Yeah, but exactly. I, it's, we it's can't grow tomatoes all the year round, yeah. but you can grow them between about June and November, yeah. even in unheated uh, polytunnels and greenhouses. Yeah. We, eat, we ought to eat tomatoes seasonally, and that's part of the well, message. I would, uh, I would advocate a patchwork solution as we move, go through this transition, for sure. Yeah. Okay, and then Phil, last, last words to you. Uh, okay, so I think everyone, when I started to talk and when everyone has spoken, I think we've all said that we need um, you know, to re a, a reform, we need to change. We know things are going to change in the future um, and we probably do need a radical change in our farming and our, uh, and, and our food consumption. But I would say that we should be careful about throwing the, the, the baby out with the, the bathwater and we should be looking at elements of our current system, such as grazing livestock and... Uh, and red meat produced off of grass, and look at where we need to fine tune those systems and make them work better for us, rather than thinking that we need to throw everything out and, and start again. And I'd just like to repeat some of the things that I tried to get across, but probably failed a little bit in terms of the sustainability of, uh, of what I see in the, in the sheep industry. You know, going back to Joe's point, we've got um, uh, sheep largely eat grass and forage. You know, now you might say that they're not waste products, but they're, they're, they're crops that we can't consume we can't eat gr grass and and most of it a lot of the areas where grass is grown in the UK uh, soil types and and terrains and climates where we can do nothing else much but produce grass and if you look in the lowlands most of the grass that is being uh, grown is either as part of a rotation which again builds soil fertility for subsequent crops or is in really valuable lowland areas such as water meadows and parkland mm. areas that we love so you know I, I would mm. say that sheep the, the diet that sheep um, feed and, and, and are raised on um, is probably one of the most sustainable uh, foods that we can get. We've been absolutely blighted by um, poor science in relation to, 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 uh, to greenhouse gas um, emissions and, and the global warming potential of, um, of our food production. And if I tell you that um, a kilogram of chicken is assumed to have a carbon footprint of around about two kilograms of carbon per kilogram of chicken uh, produced, uh, and, a, and a, an ordinary lowland sheep is uh, supposed to have a carbon footprint of around about 14 kilograms of, uh, of carbon. And if you go up into the hills and the uplands where things are as natural as they can possibly get, uh, the carbon footprint of a lamb is around about 16 kilograms. So it's all perverse and it's wrong, and they're counting the wrong things. They're counting um, greenhouse gas uh, 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 circulations, which have been part of our natural gaseous cycles for millions and millions of years and not separating uh, the greenhouse gases that come from fossil fuels. Even water, if you look at the water okay. consumption per kilogram of lamb, it's a ridiculous figure, but they count the rain that falls on the grass. <laughs> now, how can that be the case? I mean, it's just absolutely nonsense. And if I could, I'd just like to wait, make two quick points. One is that I do believe that we should be including food, healthy food as a public good within this whole debate about policy tools to, to, to reward public good. And secondly, workers. Um, you know, again, within the sheep industry, we've got about 50,000 sheep farms in the UK, um, and there's no shortage of youngsters coming into this industry. They can get a foothold. They don't need to be workers because they can actually become business. They can become entrepreneurs and have their own businesses running sheep on other people's lands as part of rotations within integrated businesses. We've got... if you. This is, I'm not saying anything about migrant workers, but if you look at the sheep industry, we've got zero reliance um, on migrant workers within the sheep industry at the farm level. It's not until you get to the industrial end of our, our, our industry, the, the processing end, that there's any reliance on migrant workers at all. And, th and that is because it's still an attractive opportunity um, to, for youngsters to come into. Okay, thanks so much indeed, Phil. Well, uh, thanks to all of our panel. Thank you all for coming. We've gone a little bit over time, but I hope you think it was worth it. Um, the next in our series is on rewilding, and there'll be more in the spring of next year too. So do keep in touch with us to look out for those events. But can I ask you to thank our brilliant panel in the usual way for their contributions tonight? <laughs>